All right, good morning. Welcome to Mercy Village Church. We're uh, happy that you're here today. You braved the elements. Uh, sh- strong work uh, on that. Hopefully it wasn't too slippery on your, way, on your way in. If you received one of these on your way in, uh, this is uh, we call an order of worship on the front, just how things are going to go today in our gathering. And then on the back, you'll find the main takeaway of the sermon and some reflection questions that have to do with the sermon, and then you'll see announcements. Um, We want to direct your attention to those. If you didn't get one of these on the way in, you can grab one on the Connect desk on the way out. Uh, Just a couple of things I will mention. You can see on here a a women's game night and a member meeting. Those are a little further out. You can see the information about those on the back. But Safe Space is back. This is a a women's uh, ministry of of, uh, Mercy Village women. And so um, it is not a professional group. It's just a group of folks who get together and just talk through different issues of life. And so they're having a kickoff gathering on the 25th of this month at 6 p.m. So they, uh, throughout the year, will talk about different topics, uh, everything from parenting to mental health in the church to just a whole host of things that they'll talk about together. Um, but this is mainly just going to be a, a kickoff for the year. Um, there might even be some free refreshments. So, um, And then D group is back as well. Uh, our discipleship group will be on January the 31st at 6.30 p.m. We have a few of these books left on top of the piano. Everyday Theology. We're in the fourth chapter of that book, but all the content's available through the app. If you wanted to catch up on the previous three sessions, you could uh, catch up on those and then join us on the 31st. In fact, some folks are doing that. There are some folks who are going to join us for the very first time this month uh, as we go through session four of that book together. Uh, So if you want to join them, you can. Just catch up on that. Uh, And if you have any questions about it, just let me know. And then our Connect cards. And I want to really encourage you, if you're new with us, you've only been here a few times, uh, we're getting to the size where it's it's getting a little bit more difficult for me to, to, to really connect directly with everyone to the point where I can let you know everything that's going on at the church. If you fill out one of those Connect cards, then that'll put you in our regular email cycle, which goes out every few weeks. Um, We'll invite you to a Facebook group that kind of puts announcements out for our church and things like that, so you can stay in touch with what's going on, and you don't miss miss anything um, if you're looking to get connected. Jeremiah is going to welcome us this morning to start our gathering, and uh, again, we're happy that you're here with us. Romans 15, 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And so the joyful, the faithful, the peaceful, we welcome you. The doubters, the ragged, the sinners, we welcome you. The put together, the winners, the known, we welcome you. The wounded, the battered, the breathless, we welcome you. Those who are saints and those who ain't, we welcome you, just like Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of our deacons here at Mercy Village Church. We're thankful for him and the ministry that he uh, pushes forward here with us. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. That is what it says on this sign over here. Uh, That is our mission statement. If we just could put on a t-shirt, that's what a mission statement tends to be, what we exist for, why we are here It is to both experience, that's a personal thing. We want to to know the redemption and renewal that we find in Christ, but we don't just want to stop there. We want to embody it out into the world around us. And so that is our mission statement. We're going to pray together to start our gathering. This is a time really to settle just a little bit maybe. If you've had a busy, busy morning, time to catch your breath and prepare have God prepare you to receive what he, what he has for us today. In a minute, we're going to do just this really quick responsive reading where kind of our crescendo as the whole crowd is going to be, great is thy faithfulness. Your mercies are made new every morning. That's taken from Lamentations 3, 22 through 23 that says this, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
So as you bow your heads with me, I'd love for you to think maybe of the places you're striving or struggling or weary, where you feel stretched thin in your life, too busy to keep your head above water. And instead of today feeling that you have to fix those things or endure those things in your own faithfulness, might we in prayer right now invite ourselves to be remembered and God to help us remember that it is His faithfulness that will carry us through. Places maybe where you're feeling the absence of the steadfast love of the Lord, maybe there's struggles that are so painful and so harmful right now that you wonder how God could even allow them to happen. Some of us face things like that. Maybe you have some of those things. You can actually picture those situations, those relationships, those circumstances in your mind right now. And and you wonder about the unending mercy of God and the, and the great faithfulness of God. Maybe you feel barren and empty in those moments. That God would show you His steadfast love. That's our prayer. And then lastly, consider the goodness of God. Vividly. The, the, maybe the places where you've seen it so perfectly displayed in your life. Maybe there's a, something you're rejoicing about right now. A new birth or a new relationship or... We find ourselves in a whole host of different places is the point I'm making. So pray with me in your hearts. Father, today reveal your faithfulness to us. In the good and in the bad, in the full and in the empty, in the healing and in the brokenness, reveal your faithfulness to us. Might we know you as we need to know you today. Wherever our circumstances are, whatever our situations are, whatever the loss or the gain of recent weeks and months and years has been, might you remind us of your faithfulness today and your goodness. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Will you stand with me? Your part will be in bold. We'll say that all together. Mine is the smaller type and it reminds us of what we just prayed. Lord, when we call to mind who you are, we are filled with hope. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Will you sing with us? Thank you, Austin. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you all. Uh, I see a lot of new faces. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm, my name's Austin McCoy. I'm a good friend of uh, Paul's and Josh here. Uh, so it's good to be here. Let's sing together. So bless the Lord. His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul I worship him Holy 
near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise on in me ten thousand years and then for it Yeah. 
scripture today comes from Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14. It says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross.
Dear God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Um, give us a good day. Um, thank you for bringing us all together here safe. And we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Kids are dismissed. All right, good. We got rid of them. Um, while we're waiting on uh, some of those parents to come back, we've made a habit of uh, taking time to pray for one of our partners or uh, someone we're connected to through one of our partnerships. So we partner with a network of church plants called Harbor Network. Uh, we do not directly support Capital City Church in Austin, Texas, but through our partnership with Harbor, some of our funding does go to see churches planted all over the United States through Harbor Network. Robbie uh, is one of the most genuinely kind and loving people I've ever met in my entire life. I've only met him three times, so maybe he'll, that'll change eventually, but <laughs> I'm just telling you, the man loves Jesus deeply, and, and he loves Austin deeply loves his wife and his family deeply, and uh, he's there. They're planting a a small, it's very small right now. That's obviously not the hope for long term, but we're going to pray for Robbie and Kristen and Abel, Piper, and Evie in Austin, Texas at Capital City Church. When I talked to him yesterday to see if there are any prayer requests, he did ask uh, in particular that we pray for one of their members who is having a uh, pretty intense surgery this coming week, uh, kind of a, a serious situation, health situation for, for that person. That's all I know, but uh, God knows all the details, so we'll pray for that as well. Father, thank you so much that we have the ability to, uh, that the church exists not just in these walls. It's all over the place. Even in our local area, it's meeting right now, place to place. And in Austin, Texas, it'll meet here in a few hours, Capital City Church. I pray that you will bless your people through them. I pray for Robbie and Kristen that you will bless their marriage, that you will strengthen their marriage, that you will give them everything that they need. I pray for their children, that you will raise them up in the love of Jesus, and that you will save them at an early age, and that for them, church planting will not be something that leads them to be jaded towards the church, but leads them to, to love Jesus and his people. I pray for this member of their core team who is facing a major surgery this coming week. I pray that you would give the healing that is required, that through the hands of the doctors, you would accomplish exactly what is the best case outcome for this, and even more, even beyond that, that you would give healing, and that you would give perseverance, and you would give peace and comfort in this situation. And I pray for their church that it will grow that it will grow to impact more and more lives with the truth about Jesus that can transform, comfort, and grow all of us into the people you desire us to be. Accomplish that work. Again, thank you for our partnership with Harbor Network, and thank you for Robbie and Kristen and their kids and what you're doing there in Austin, Texas. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. JC, you're going to read our scripture for us, please. Matthew 5, 3 through 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word word of our our God God will stand stand forever. forever. Amen. Thank you, JC. I'm going to start by showing you something here, this guy. I've got to pull up my notes to remember his name exactly. His name is Destin Sandlin. Do we have his picture? There he is. What a nerd. I'm just kidding. Don't ever tell him I said that. I don't know if you've seen this guy uh, before. What he did, and he kind of got YouTube recognition. I don't think it went viral or anything, but I don't even remember how I saw it or who showed it to me. But in the next picture, you'll see it's this real simple thing that he did to a bicycle. Just those two little gears there made all the difference. You'll see this picture of me. He reversed the, the way that the bike... Like when you turn it right, it would go left, and when you turn it left, it would go right, and then he tried to learn how to ride it, and it's 
pretty funny to watch. It is so ingrained in his brain and in all of our brains, actually, because uh, to ride a bike the way that is normal, it's just really difficult to pull this off, the, the backwards bike. Well, then he tours around to high schools and places and tries to get other people to ride the bike. And of course, it doesn't work out very well. But he himself learned to ride the bike. Eventually, he retrained his brain to pull this off. Now, what's interesting, if you know the story, is that eventually he ends up in Amsterdam after he's spent eight months riding the backwards bicycle. He ends up in Amsterdam. Uh, he, there, there's some folks from his YouTube channel. I guess he has an audience there. Uh, some of them came, someone brought him a normal bike, a bike that rides the right way. And he absolutely could not ride that bike because tr- his brain had been trained to ride it backwards. Now, here's the point. This is exactly the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is often referred to and, and perceived by the world and even by us to be a backwards sermon, to be about a backwards kingdom. The truth of the matter is that the curse of sin has made us all like Destin was when he got to Amsterdam. We've all learned to do life backwards. We've all learned to do it the wrong way, and so when Jesus presents his way, it seems weird and strange and backwards to us. But it's actually a right-way kingdom. The kingdom of God is the right way, So sin has reversed our thinking. We've been riding through life on proverbial bikes like the guy in the intro, like Destin. And we've come to think of that as the the right way. The curse of sin has left us thinking. Left is right, up is down. So much so that when Jesus comes along and says, let me show you the right way. Come to me. Take my yoke. Learn from me. I'll give you grace. I'll give you an eternal and invincible kingdom. Our natural response is, that all sounds backwards to me. But actually, humbly, myself included, we're the idiots who have learned how to ride the bike backwards. And Jesus is presenting us the right way. In his ministry, Jesus comes along saying, I'll teach you how to walk, how to live, how to speak how to ride through this life, and and I'll empower you to do it. And I'll even carry you in the times when you can't do it yourself. And we struggle with it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus invites us to see the right way kingdom. You see, Christian, Jesus has blessed us with an unconditional invitation into a relationship with himself that then transforms us into the right way of living, the right way of thinking, the right way of being. That invitation is unconditional. We don't earn it. We don't earn that favor from Him. It's His grace. By grace through faith, we receive it. But then in that relationship, we enter in at no cost. We enter in by no merit of our own. But that's not the end of the story. Because for the true children of God, transformation comes. Our brains get rewired to live life the right way. And we are transformed by the finished work of Jesus. And then for the rest of our earthly lives, He calls us further up and further into that relationship with Him, into that transformation. And so for all of us along our timeline as Christians today, if if you are a Christian, you find the Sermon on the Mount butting up against you in certain ways that may be unique to you that are slightly different for other people up and down these rows, but for every single one of us. It's calling us further up and further into believing that Jesus' way is the right way and into the transformation that He's provided for us to become like Him. Here's what we'll see in the Sermon on the Mount today, the Beatitudes in particular. We've just kicked this off. The true Christian is blessed in Jesus. That's the first thing. It's unconditional. It happens. But we're blessed to do something. We're blessed to live like Jesus so that we might receive the blessings of Jesus all the more abundantly 
than we could ever imagine. That's, we'll come back to this at the end, but like the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes present this like cyclical reality. We're blessed unconditionally and transformed into the image of Jesus. And as we become more like Jesus, we become all the more blessed and more abundantly blessed and more abundantly blessed so that we can live more like Jesus and be more blessed. That's the cyclical nature of it. In Christ, if you're a Christian, we're already itty-bitty beatitude babies. We are. like we, we, It's in us already the power, the strength, the ability to live in the ways presented on the Sermon on the Mount. But we still have to mature. We have to grow into that. We have to develop by God's grace and strength into those people. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Last week we saw the first four Beatitudes. We saw that the children of God, as we are transformed, the true children of God, as we are transformed, there's something that happens in the core of us. There's actual character change inside of us. We looked at the Beatitudes, the first four, and we saw not only a model of who Jesus is, because he fulfills all of these perfectly, but how the children of God and the power of Jesus are supposed to look as well. On the inside, we read blessed are the poor in spirit, the, the destitute, those who are desperate in their need for God. Blessed are those people. Uh, Eugene Peterson put it this way in the message, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and His rule. We read, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be literally brought into the presence of the one who is speaking. That was like the original language that Jesus spoke with. He, he said, blessed are you who need comforted, because I will be to you that comfort. I will bring you into my presence, and I will comfort you. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you, the message says. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. We read, blessed are the meek, those who are not overly impressed with themselves, those who, who have no self-importance in them. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. And then we read, blessed are those who feel the deep pangs of, of lack, lack of righteousness. We long for the righteousness of God. And not just in the world around us, although that is part of it. We look at everything that's happening, the injustices of the world, and we long to see it made right. That is a deep part of what it means to be a Christian. But it starts inside the lack that you have, the lack that I have inside of ourselves, we have to look at that first. I lack that transformation. I need to be more like Jesus. The internal part of me is jacked up sometimes and I need transformation. And in that, we then begin to long to see that in the world around us. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. Eugene Peterson says he's food and drink and the best meal that you'll ever eat. So that's what the children of God we saw last week look like at the core of their being. That's what we're being transformed into internally. This week, the final four Beatitudes, we see what's happening through and to the true children of God. We have, a, we have four more Beatitudes. The first is in verse 7. Verse 7 says uh, of Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the merciful... For they shall receive mercy. Think compassion when you hear merciful. And think of being full of it. Not full of it. Oh, he's full of it. But full of compassion. Full of mercy. Filled up with it. And it's two parts. It's a heart posture, yes. It's a feeling. But it's also an endeavor of the hands and the feet and the ears and the mouths of Jesus' people. Like, being merciful doesn't just happen on the couch. Although it can begin there and should begin there or in a pew or in a time of prayer. But it can't just be internal. For it to be the mercy of God, it has to work its way out through our hands and our feet. Matthew actually tells us of, of two moments in Jesus' life later on in, in the book of Matthew, that are instructive to us. 
Matthew chapter 9, 36 through 38 tells us that Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So he feels the compassion, and then what does he do? Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. The first time we read the word compassion and see it welling up in Jesus' heart, his response is prayer. That's one active thing that we should be doing, praying. Compassion is felt, and then prayer happens in Jesus' life, and we see that as a model. We pray. We like to move on to the next one that we see in verse 14 where he actually does something, or do we do nothing at all, but the thing we're usually least likely to do is pray. We either feel some compassion and then do nothing, or we feel some compassion and then start doing. But very rarely, and maybe I'm just the only one, but if I miss my my guess, if it's just me that's this way, then sorry, I don't mean to accuse anyone of being this way, but it tends to seem to me that we just move right past prayer. But that's where Jesus starts. Just pray. Let that compassion, those feelings of mercy, move you to a place of prayer. Then in chapter 14, it doesn't just end in the prayer closet or prayer room. Uh, Chapter 14, verse 14, when he went ashore, this is another moment, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. And then what's he do? He healed their sick. Compassion is felt and and then he heals and he he feeds later on in that same story. He'll actually feed the people as, as well. In the kingdom of God, it is not compassion unless it's a feeling that leads to action. That's what true mercy and true compassion looks like in the kingdom. And the beauty of that beatitude is that those who show mercy, those who show compassion, who live it, will receive it from God. The message says it this way, you're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, like full of care, you find yourself cared for. So are you compassionate? Does your heart break for the broken? Does your heart break for the hurting? Do you see those who are disadvantaged or in a hard place, and is your first response like, well, at least it isn't me, or well, in some cases, they deserve it, or well... Or is it compassion that leads to prayer and then to action? Verse 8 gives us another beatitude from Jesus. Jesus continues. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This This one is a tough one, actually. If we're honest, of all the Beatitudes, we could easily begin to like kind of talk ourselves a little way in, into saying, maybe that's true of me. I might not be merciful all the time, but sometimes I show it. We could go, I might not be meek all the time, but sometimes I show it. And you see little inklings of these in us. But if we're honest, the one we absolutely cannot achieve is having a heart, which literally the pure, pure in heart means without any sin, without any defilement, without any brokenness, without anything that's jacked up. Perfect hearts. Blessed are those who have perfect hearts. Nope, not me. I don't have one. That ain't me. I'm not guiltless, not even close. This is one of the clearest teachings of Scripture, by the way, is that we're not pure in heart. Psalm 24, which we saw on Christmas Eve, David says to to his audience, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who gets to God? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Not us. David later begs God to create in him a clean heart. He understands that he himself can't have a pure heart, and so he begs God to do it. Because none of us have a clean heart or can clean it up ourselves. That's why verses like Titus 2.14 are so precious to the Christian. Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works, Jesus does the work required for you to have a pure heart. Take courage today, if you're being honest, and I pray that we would all be honest. And we'll come back to this here in a minute. 
But in the meantime, be honest with yourself. You're blessed, this verse says, when you get the inside world, your heart and mind put right, then you can see God in the outside world. For us to get it put right on the inside, we need Jesus. Verse 9 gives us another beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Those who seek out peace and pursue it will be called part of God's family. But think about that idea. A peacemaker is one who's seeking unity, seeking peace, seeking reconciliation, seeking the end of division. But, but quite frankly, it's always been this way. I think society's always been this way, always been full of division. Social media makes it more prevalent. The news media makes it more prevalent. We can see it. We're just inundated all the time with it. But think back to the, to the bike intro, right? Think about him when he first started learning to ride the backwards bike. He's like, like his arms are shaking and his legs are shaking. And he's like, you know, at any moment looks like he's about to fall over. And then think of the world we live in. Think of every sector. Think of your new, the news stations and your social media feed. And think about the ball field when the umpire gets the call wrong. And, and think about city council meetings. And yes, even think about churches if you've been around enough of them in your life. And, and oftentimes we, the church and the world, look like a bunch of idiots on those backwards bikes riding around who can barely stay up ourselves but then we point at everybody else's bikes and say, you're doing it wrong, right? Like we're over here, can hardly stay up. Look at this idiot over here, right? Sometimes we're even really good people. We even like kind of kick their bike and like try to knock them down, undermine them. I mean, that's society. Now, sometimes we get our little uh, backwards biker gang. So we get some more people like our echo chamber of people who agree with us about certain things. So we feel a little bit more like we're not lone rangers in it, and, and we'll ride around on our backwards bikes together and make fun of everybody else's whose backwards bikes don't look the same. This is really fun to do. You can try it later. I'm tempted to just keep talking about it so I can keep doing it. But only kingdom eyes look at society living like that and say, that's backwards. That's not the way that it's supposed to be. Romans 12 is helpful. Romans 12 tells us what the kingdom looks like, verses 16 through 21. I do something you have to be expounded on, we're in a, and that's good for you. We're not preaching Romans 12, but just listen to it. Say, is this me? Am I this person? Now, I've multiple times read it this week, and, and just to give you the liberty to be honest with yourself, I'm not this person, so the preacher's not this person. You can be honest with yourself here. Listen, to live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him uh, something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That sounds backwards. But what Jesus is saying is that we are the ones who are backwards when we don't live like that. And it's so easy, and, and again, to look at Palestine and Israel right now, or Russia and Ukraine, and think, man, people are so jacked up. And it's true. But here's the truth, and it hurts. You are capable of that too. It's in you to either move in the direction of what we just read in Romans 12 by Jesus' power, or apart from Jesus' power, to move further and further and further in the direction of those who leverage their power to get whatever they want, no matter the cost, on other people. And again, I don't say that to say that we shouldn't fight for justice in places. We should. But don't ever fight from a place of thinking that you're incapable of being just as jacked up. Or you'll just become another one of those people. 
Because when you fight for justice and finally get the power to enact it, (laughs) you're still going to have the same soul inside of you that you had at the start. But now you're going to have some power. Okay? So be honest. We need changed. Might one of our strongest kingdom apologetics here at Mercy Village Church, by God's grace, be our calmness, our desire for harmony, our desire for unity, our humility, our turning of the other cheek, our honoring of of others. When others pick up stones to throw, might we stand strong in peacefulness. Peacemakers will be called the sons of God. The message says it like this. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are, who you're meant to be, and your place in God's family. Hear me. This is the the main application of this beatitude. When the God of the universe says over you, with all the authority that he possesses as God, you are mine. When God says that over you, you are mine and I will treat you as a firstborn son. That's what it means, you will be sons of God. It's not, a, it's not an outcasting of uh, females. What he's saying is you, whether you're male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free, will be treated like the society that Jesus was in at the time treated their firstborn sons. Every last one of you will be treated like firstborn sons, regardless. Jesus says, when God says over you, I will treat you like my firstborn children. I love you. You are mine. I am with you. I will welcome you into my presence as a child today and tomorrow and forever. When you believe that reality, we'd be a lot more calm. We'd be a lot more peaceful when things appear to be falling apart if we believe that the God of the universe has said over us, you are mine. Be a lot less reasons to fight and argue and abuse and condemn. We'd have a lot more reasons to seek peace if we could believe that truth. We are the children of the king. Children of the king don't have to respond to every insult. They don't have to flex their muscles at at every turn. They don't have to demean every opposing position. They don't have to panic at every threat because they truly know their children of the king. He finishes with what's the most insane, though. If you don't think it's insane yet, right? Like we look at the Sermon on the Mount, especially the Beatitudes, and we think, yeah, that sounds good, but in real life, really, I don't know. He just cranks up the insanity in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted. (laughs) Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We talked about that word blessed last week, meaning divine favor and transcendent peace and joy belongs to those who are persecuted. That sounds counterintuitive. How can persecution be peace? How can persecution be transcendent joy? How can persecution be a place where I experience the divine favor of God? Word of caution, though, this is important. It does say they're persecuted for righteousness' sake, not persecuted for being buttheads, right? Like, okay, that matters, really does. Especially if you've been in the church long enough, perhaps you've seen so-called Christian preachers who wear their persecution as a badge of honor, but really they just have ministries that are marked by zero meekness, zero humility, Zero peacemaking, zero self-sacrifice. They've skipped all of those steps. They're just out there being jerks, stirring up crap, and now they're persecuted, duh, and they think it's a sign of their righteousness. This isn't that. It's, it's those who are persecuted for the sake of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus, washing feet, turning the other cheek, defending the weak and the marginalized, following only Jesus, will not always be met by the favor of the world. Jesus came washing feet and loving the poor, pushing back against the religious hypocrites and saying, follow me. Don't follow the Roman way, follow the Jesus way. Don't follow the way of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, follow me. And they killed him. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. 
the persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Jesus continues with this theme in verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There's two last things to notice about persecution here, at least in this passage. One is that sometimes it's just verbal. It's insults. In fact, the way that it's written is like they've exhausted all the negative things they could say about you. They found one way to say it, and then they found another way to say it, and another way to say it. They, they rearranged the sentences. They've, they've condemned you. They've bashed you. They've made fun of you. They've mocked you. They've done it quietly. They've done it loud. They've done it on social media. They've done it in your friend circle. They've done it every possible way. They've exhausted their words. They, they, they can't eat, continue mocking you because they've done all of it that they can. And then there's also the actions and the harassment and the harm that sometimes counts. And again, it's on the account of Jesus following him, not on the account of just being a, a jerk, but on account of adopting the message of Jesus and the value system of the, of the kingdom. When you stop loving what the world loves, you will be mocked. When you stop living for what the world lives for, you will be mocked. You'll be called weak. You'll be called naive. You'll be called foolish. When you align yourself with the way of the kingdom, when you say God's way of defining the way I use my money, God's way of defining the way I view marriage, God's way of defining the way I see the immigrant, God's way of defining the way I see sex or vacation or career, everything. That, that everything that is in this world, God's way of, of interacting with the poor will be my standard of interacting with the poor. God's thoughts on what I should prioritize will be my priorities. When you let the ways of Jesus shape the way you think, and talk and engage in everything. You'll be told you're on the wrong side of history. That you're too soft or too bigoted. Sometimes in the same day you can be called both. You'll be pushed out of the way. Jumped over for promotions. They'll hire somebody else instead of you. They'll laugh at someone else when you crave in the way that you craved their laughter, and they'll laugh at you in the ways that you disdain their laughter. Others will be welcomed into the friend circle, and you will not. You might even get canceled in certain places of your life. When you turn the other cheek, they'll just slap you again. When you wash their feet, they'll act like you owe it to them to do it. And they won't even say thank you. And at the moment you encourage them to follow the true way of Jesus, they'll call you names and throw you out the door, or even worse, that will happen. At varying levels and in varying ways, sometimes it might be subtle, sometimes it might be loud, but you will be persecuted for following Jesus. So how do we respond? Like idiots, we rejoice and we're glad. Why? Because the affirmation and blessing and acceptance of this world is fool's gold in comparison to the rewards that belong to those who are of the kingdom. The Bible has a long history and Christianity has a long history of people who were persecuted for walking away from the fool's gold that the world offers for the true rewards of heaven. Cannot be that cannot rust or be destroyed. Matthew 6, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Do not lay up for yourself treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, but where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
What, God, what Jesus says in the Beatitudes is that the persecution of the world is a sign that you're loving the right things. And those who love the right things will receive all the blessings and rewards of the kingdom of God. Infinitely higher value than anything this world could give you. If you ever have the chance to watch that video of De- Destin, the backwards bike guy, trying to ride the right bike, you know, the proper bike in Amsterdam, you'll see him for like 10 or 15 minutes tried to do it. They edit it. It's not, you don't have to watch it for 10 or 15 minutes. But, but after 10 or 15 minutes, you see it. It clicks in his brain. It just clicks. And he's riding the bike again. The way it was designed to be ridden. My prayer for us, as we continue through the Sermon on the Mount, as we close out the Beatitudes, is that God will click the light bulb on in our heads up and down these rows, every last one of us, to see afresh that God's way is the right way. Maybe in hyper-specific things in your life that I don't even know about where you're wrestling with whether to, whether to do it God's way or to do it your way, that God will reveal to you that his way is best and will have the courage and the peace and the strength to walk in it. Three things to remember if you're a Christian that come out of this. One is that the gospel speaks of you being blessed first. Like I said, it's cyclical. God reaches you first. You don't have to to do the Beatitudes to get to God. God comes to you through Jesus and freely gives you himself. That's the gospel. By grace through faith, you receive that blessing. Blessed are the meek. You're not meek unless you've been blessed by God through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Blessed are the meek, for they shall. Read the Beatitudes like that. Only those who are blessed can even live this way. Only those who are in Christ can even live this way. So you're already blessed, and you're blessed to then be a blessing. I have a friend in Uganda. We actually support his wife, Alpha Girl Care Uganda. He, he would always say that when we first met him, like his way of, of like putting off a compliment. I'd be like, you do all these medical clinics in these rural villages? That's really just amazing. Thank you so much for doing it. It's so be- beautiful work. Well, I'm just blessed to be a blessing. <laughs> so we would, like, then we started to make fun of him, right? Like whenever he was being a jerk, which he was capable of, we'd be like, yeah, T- Tim's just blessed to be a blessing. You know, it's like, felt cheesy. But it's true. It- it's true. Although you won't see me wearing that on a t-shirt. We're blessed to be a blessing. We're not blessed to just be blessed and move on with our lives. We're blessed to be transformed into people who are a blessing to the world around us. That when you move away from a community where God takes you home to be with Him, it's felt. They brought something with them to every relationship, they brought something with them to every situation, circumstance. We're blessed so that we can be those types of people. Don't get it twisted around because if, if you think you have to be those type of people to get Jesus' favor, that'll put you in a rat race of always trying to earn his love. But if instead you start with the fact, I'm blessed by God in Christ, filled up with all the blessings that belong to me in Christ, then you can live out that way. And then two, the tangible blessings of God are already, but not yet. And what I mean by that is is there's a lot of promises in the Beatitudes of things that will come to you. And and you might say, okay, I'm blessed to live this way. And I see transformation happening in my life. But yet I don't feel the full magnitude of these blessings that are promised in the Beatitudes. Don't quit. The Bible is clear. In some ways, you already are receiving the blessings of God but one day you will receive them fully in glory. Don't expect to get everything in this life. It very rarely works out that way. But don't for a second doubt that God's going to come through on His promise to make everything completely whole just the way it's supposed to be. He will. 
And then lastly, this is my only word of caution, and I don't mean to create fear in anyone, but if you look at the Beatitudes, right, if the reality is that the true children of God are blessed to be transformed into people who look like this, and you look at the Beatitudes and you see no evidence of them in your life, then maybe you're not a true child of God. If when you look at the list of Beatitudes, I'm not, I'm not saying you, you're perfect in them, none of us are, but you don't see any evidence of that stuff. I don't even, that's not part of my life at all. None of those things. Maybe you're not a true Christian. That can change today. Jesus died on the cross in your place so you could be made right with God, and He extends to you that invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How do you come to Him? By grace through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Jesus died in your place. Because he was perfect in everything the Beatitudes require and everything the Beatitudes accomplish, and he could take our place. And he did on the cross. Blood spills out of his hands and his feet. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We can be made right with God. If you're not a Christian, I'd love to talk with you about that today. If you are a Christian, remember that the true Christian is blessed in Jesus to live like Jesus. We're called to that. Like we live like Jesus. Father, thank you so much for the Beatitudes. Thank you for speaking them to us through your Son, Jesus. Might we here in this place not be filled with guilt and shame as we look at that list of things that we're called to. I'm in, in, in particular struck by the peacemaker piece. Maybe that's why I talked about it so much. I just I want to see more of that in my life. And so I know there's there's a gap there between who I am as a peacemaker, and who I'm called to be by the Beatitudes. And the temptation for all of us in here in in each unique place that we see ourselves coming up short is to feel guilt and shame. Might that not be the result? Might instead we be led to the cross to remember that through the finished work of your son Jesus on the cross, we are brought into a relationship with you. We are already blessed. We don't have to earn your favor, but instead from that place of being blessed By you, we then can continue to be transformed. And might there be growth all up and down these rows in our lives that we would become people each day a little bit more like Jesus, a little bit more like Jesus, a little bit more like Jesus. If there's anyone here who's not a Christian, I pray you'd save them. Give them faith to believe the gospel. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Some weeks we take 60 seconds to catch our breath. Silence is so elusive in our culture. It's not even full silence here. We play music over the speakers, but take this time, 60 seconds before we serve communion, to just sit and reflect on maybe what God spoke into your heart during this time, and then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We'll take time for communion. If you're new with us this week, uh, we do this as a weekly reminder. We don't do an altar call, but we do have communion where we're faced with the reality that Jesus gave his body and his blood for us. And so we do this together. We offer gluten-free in the middle. We hand this out. We'll get up. We will receive this. We'll sit down and we'll take this meal together. If you're a believer, we invite you to take this with us. Even if you're not a member, if you're not a believer, just observe the body of Christ as we take this meal or trust Jesus today and take it with us. Uh, We're reminded today in Mark chapter 14, says, And as they were eating, he, Jesus, took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So Christian, today we're reminded of who Jesus is and this promise that one day we will share this meal with him. But today we do this as family. So let's take this and observe the body of Christ. This is a symbol of Christ's body that was broken for us. This is a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed for us. Will you stand with me as we pray? 
Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, making yourself known. God, that you've, you have bought us with a price. You gave your only son to die in our place. And so as we're gathered today, God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for finding us where we were, that you predestined us to be your sons and daughters. God, as we leave this place, help us to be a blessing. You have blessed us. God, help us to share our faith with others in the places that you've put us on mission, with our families, in our neighborhoods, community, with our jobs. God, help us to share our faith. Give us boldness. Holy Spirit, give us the words that we could see more people, the fame of Jesus, the name of Jesus be lifted up. Not the name of Mercy Village, but the name of Jesus. That is our hope. That is our desire. And we are nothing without you. So help us. Teach us in that. Help us to share our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Receive this benediction. Now as you depart, take his yoke upon you and learn from him. For he is gentle and humble of heart that you might find in him rest for your souls. For he has said, I give my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. You are secure in Christ. Go in peace.